Welcome everyone for this crucial lecture on oxygen dissociation curve. At the end of this lecture, you will be able to understand the basic concept and practical application of oxygen dissociation curve. We will also cover clinically why hemoglobin concentration is more relevant than saturation in defining oxygen content of body. Let's start then. Let's link the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve with the oxygen binding at hemoglobin sites. So each hemoglobin molecule has four binding sites for oxygen. At low pressure or concentration of oxygen, the affinity of hemoglobin site to oxygen is pretty low. And the structure of hemoglobin is called tight configuration, meaning it is hard to bind the oxygen initially. This is seen on oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve as a flat blue line at low partial pressures of oxygen. When the pressure of oxygen around the hemoglobin starts to increase, the binding of first oxygen molecule causes the configurational change in hemoglobin such that the affinity for oxygen on second binding site is higher than on the first binding site. Once the second site is attached to the oxygen, it even further enhances the affinity of oxygen on third site, causing oxygen to bind more and more avidly now. This is termed as positive cooperativity, which causes a sudden steep rise in saturation to relatively smaller PO2 changes as shown here in pink color. So now the hemoglobin is in more relaxed configuration. Beyond 70 millimeters mercury oxygen pressure in the surrounding area, all four sites of hemoglobin are bound now to oxygen molecules. And this is what we call a fully saturated hemoglobin. This is the principle behind pulse oximetry. The device transmits infrared and red wavelengths. The oxyhemoglobin absorbs the infrared and reflects back red, whereas deoxyhemoglobin absorbs red and this is why desaturation causes cyanosis, clinically appearing blue. Now observe the upper plateau phase of dissociation curve. Saturation in pulmonary and capillary and artery will remain around 98 to 100% despite mild differences in PO2 levels. So what is the clinical relevance of this plateau phase? Well, at alveolar level, we know that oxygen pressure in alveoli normally is around 99 millimeters of mercury where deoxyhemoglobin comes in and receives oxygen until fully saturated hemoglobin moves out, right? Suppose for some reason now alveolar pressure of oxygen falls to 80 millimeters of mercury. Still the dissociation curve is falling within the upper plateau range. So hemoglobin would still take away maximum oxygen, meaning fully saturated, while it leaves the alveoli. So as long as alveolar oxygen pressures are above 70, Hemoglobin passing along the alveolar wall will continue to stay in upper plateau fully saturated phase. The dissociation curve behaves in exactly the same manner in reverse direction as well, when pressure of oxygen starts falling. Alarm bells should start ringing if patient saturation on pulse oximeter falls below 90% because of two reasons. Number one, 90% saturation means oxygen pressure is around 60 millimeters of mercury the cutoff point for declaring hypoxia. And number two, below 90% saturation, there is a steep drop because the dissociation curve lands in the steep portion of the curve. So below 90%, the saturation will drop precipitously with smaller changes in PO2 levels. So clinically, there is little window of opportunity to reverse hypoxia there. Once oxygen is taken by tissues for use, the pressure of oxygen in veins falls to around 40 millimeters of mercury normally. And if we see on dissociation curve, at 40 millimeters of mercury pressure of oxygen, the saturation should be around 70 to 75%. Remember the rule of 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So for 40, 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury, the saturation is 70, 80 and 90%. So we can see the oxyhemoglobin blood leaving the lungs is in upper plateau portion of dissociation curve whereas the deoxyhemoglobin blood in veins is in steep part of the curve. Done? Last but not the least is the value of P50, which is asked more than often in exams. In normal person, the P50 or the pressure of oxygen at which the hemoglobin is 50% saturated is 27 millimeters of mercury. The P50 signifies the status of hemoglobin affinity to oxygen, 
and can change with changing physiological parameters. Which brings us to the next part of video, the left versus right shifts in oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Logic dictates that the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen should change between lungs to tissues, right? Because in lungs you want hemoglobin to pick up oxygen and in tissues we need hemoglobin to unload the oxygen. This is brought about by changing physiological parameters. Up till now the values we revised were for normal constant physiological parameters. That is 7.4 pH, 37 degrees Celsius temperature and normal carbon dioxide pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury. Now this is about to change. As hemoglobin carrying the oxygen reaches the muscles and tissues, remember the mnemonic for exercising muscle as hot, acid and hypercapnic. The temperature increases. Lactate and hydrogen ions increase, causing acidic environment for hemoglobin. And of course, carbon dioxide is produced in the tissues. All these factors along with rise in 2-3 DPG levels cause the right shift in oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, reducing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So remember, R for right, R for reduced affinity. So in normal black graph you can see, Hemoglobin was 80% saturated at 50 millimeters mercury oxygen pressures. But in right shift green graph, the same 50 millimeters mercury oxygen pressure would cause only 48% saturation of hemoglobin, marked in green for ease. This reduced affinity of oxygen helps in offloading of oxygen by hemoglobin in tissues. In conjunction with CO2 rising, this is called the Bohr effect. To better understand this interplay between carbon dioxide and oxygen for hemoglobin, check out our detailed video link in top right corner. The flip side of this spectrum is left shift in dissociation curve. So where all the parameters would start going low. So L for left, L for lower. When temperature, hydrogen ions, carbon dioxide and 2-3 DPG levels all go low in the surroundings of hemoglobin, the dissociation curve shifts leftwards, meaning Hemoglobin increases its affinity for oxygen and tries to pull as many oxygen molecules as it can. So for the same PO2 levels of 50 millimeters of mercury, in left shift marked in purple, hemoglobin becomes almost 95% saturated, very high compared to the right shift curve, right? This is the basis for oxygen loading in lungs, so L for left, L for lower and L for loading of oxygen in lungs. Remember that. Carbon monoxide poisoning can also cause the left shift in dissociation curve. Carbon monoxide itself binds 250 times more strongly to hemoglobin than oxygen. Where else does this phenomena occur? In packed RCCs stored at minus 4 degrees Celsius, which has low temperature and low 2,3 dpg, and the transfused hemoglobin therefore is left shifted. So it doesn't effectively unload the oxygen in tissues. It takes even 24 hours after the transfusion for the transfused red blood cells and hemoglobin for optimal performance. Lastly, the fetal hemoglobin, also called the HPF, has P50 of 19 millimeters of mercury compared to 27 millimeters of mercury for normal hemoglobin, meaning it is highly left shifted or more affinity for oxygen. On the other end, mother's hemoglobin is slightly right shifted or reduced affinity because of raised 2-3 dpg levels with p50 of around 30 millimeters of mercury oxygen pressures. So whenever fetal hemoglobin faces off with the mother hemoglobin in placental interface, the fetal hemoglobin steals away oxygen more avidly and mother offloads the oxygen easily to the fetus. Such a beautiful work of nature. The last portion of this video is more clinical oriented. It is the question of oxygen saturation versus actual oxygen content. How much does saturation really affect the oxygen content? Once at high oxygen concentration, all four sides of hemoglobin are occupied by oxygen, the hemoglobin is said to be fully saturated and this is called the oxygen capacity of hemoglobin, right? So one gram of hemoglobin at oxygen capacity or 100% saturation carries 1.34 milliliters of oxygen. Done? Now remember. It is the hemoglobin concentration, not the hemoglobin saturation, that defines the oxygen content in blood. I'll explain how. Remember the oxygen content equation we discussed in previous video, link in top right corner? So oxygen content is equal to hemoglobin into 1.34 into saturation. 
plus PO2 into 0.003. Now this PO2 is the dissolved form which contributes only 1 to 2% to the total oxygen content. So for ease, let's just cut this portion of equation and concentrate on the carried form of oxygen in hemoglobin which contributes 98% to the total oxygen content. Now I said it is the hemoglobin concentration that defines the oxygen content. So let's have a normal person with 15 grams per dl hemoglobin and let's compare it with anemic patient having hemoglobin concentration of 7.5 grams per dl. For hypothetical ease, let's keep oxygen saturation and PO2 levels in both patients at 100% and 92 millimeters of mercury respectively. The only difference is now the hemoglobin concentration. Okay, so for normal patient, how much will be the oxygen content in arteries? As per the equation, so 15 hemoglobin into 1.34 into 1 or 100% saturation. So 20 milliliters of oxygen being carried per dl of blood at 15 hemoglobin, right? Now the minimum oxygen extraction below which hypoxia occurs, also called the minimum metabolic demand of body, is 5 ml of oxygen per deciliter of blood. So tissue extracts 5 ml of oxygen from arterial blood. Now in normal case, veins have 40 millimeters of mercury oxygen pressure and 75% saturation as seen previously. So let's calculate the oxygen content in veins as 15 into 1.34 into 0.75 or 75% saturation equals 15 ml of oxygen per deciliter of blood. So 20 in arteries, 5 taken by the tissues leaving behind 15 in veins. So let's compare with anemic patient. The oxygen content in arteries since hemoglobin is now 7.5, so 7.5 into 1.34 into 1 equals 10 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of arterial blood. So you see just by reduction of hemoglobin concentration, the arterial oxygen content in anemic is literally reduced to half of normal value despite 100% oxygen saturation. So when 5 ml is extracted, the remaining oxygen content in veins would be 10 minus 5, so 5 ml of oxygen per deciliter of venous blood. If you use same oxygen content equation to calculate saturation now, it would be literally venous saturation dropping to 50% with oxygen pressures in veins dropping to 27 millimeters of mercury as per the dissociation curve. And this is at just the minimum tissue extraction we are discussing let alone that exercising muscle demand of oxygen extraction. So you see how oxygen content is really dependent more on hemoglobin concentration than hemoglobin saturation. Oxygen saturation on the other hand is defined by left and right shifts in dissociation curve subject to physiological parameters and of course the surrounding PO2 levels. This is it for today. Join us next time as we get back to oxygen cascade and discuss arterial oxygen transport system.